Uh-oh, it looks like we piqued your interest in the hideout. First of all, let me tell you what the hideout is not. The hideout is not for hustlers, for grinders, or for people who are looking for a shortcut to what the world calls success. The hideout is about growing as men, creating lifelong friendships, and having the time of our lives. Are you ready to tap in to the endless source that will take you from success to significance? The hideout is two and a half days of hiking, biking, and doing the little things that it takes to create lifelong friendships. I find that joy is nothing more than falling in love with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. And that's when we see growth in every area of your life. Have you accomplished your goals professionally and financially and you still thirst for something more? Has success in these areas come at the expense of far more valuable things like your family, your children, and your relationships? Alignment in business, strategic partnerships, and joint ventures all come from true relationships. The Hideout is designed to get to know people before you'll ever need them. This is not your typical mastermind. The Hideout is focused on the one thing that will fuel everything, joy. And when joy is overflowing in your life, you'll find growth in your marriage, your relationships, and oh yeah, your business. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas Podcast, where attitude is everything on today's show. Uh, you guys can see him already. That's a handsome dude over there. He had to change his angle on his uh, on his camera because not everything was straight. So I'm excited to be able to buckle up for this episode. Uh, this man, when, when, we, when we met right off the bat, I could tell that he had this thing, this four-letter word that I love to use all the time. My mom wasn't about four-letter words, but I love them, which is grit. And he started to tell me about his story, and I was so intrigued, I was so interested in it, and I was so inspired by it, because it wasn't that, hey, I had all these advantages, it was just that I took what I had, and I made what I wanted. And it's incredible to be able to have him, he, uh, he, he comes with um, high accolades from friends, and what I was telling him before we started the show, I got a friend named Sean Finnegan. And Sean Finnegan, honestly, like if you're a friend of his, like you got access to the entire world. This is the Tony Stark, the modern day Tony Stark uh, in, in today's world. This guy is absolutely phenomenal. And um, we were talking, uh, Kyle and I were talking, and I said, you know, Sean, what Sean was saying about you or when you weren't there means more to me than what he would say to you while he's there because that shows true character. And um, I'm so excited to be able to dive in today, to be able to learn about building a multi-million dollar business, a nationwide business, um, simply because he put his mind to it and went after it and was willing to do the work. Um, so I want to uh, I want to welcome to the show, Mr. Kyle Deaver. I asked him about his titles. He wasn't that, you know, he wasn't hung up on those things, but he is the president of GoPerformanceWindows.com, and we're going to talk about BadBetProductions.com. He's the founder of that, too. Um, so welcome to the show, Kyle. Man, Kelly, what an intro. I'll tell you what, I've, I've got my own podcast, and I was watching your intro and seeing this whole setup. I went, man, I got I to gotta get my guys on this. This is a cool <laughs> setup you've got, man. Well, I appreciate it, man. So I wanted I want to ask a question that generally people don't get a chance to uh, connect, but I've connected this over the years, right? You told me that you went on a mission in Africa, right? And you, a mission, for those of you who don't know, in the LDS, uh, you go for two years, uh, you change your first name to Elder. I'm just joking with you. Um, you go to a place, you have to sell door to door something that you actually don't possess in your hands, and you get doors slammed in your face. You get told to, to go jump in a river at times. Um, and you know, occasionally somebody asks you in. Um, but I find that people that come back <coughs> and go through that process, I never got to go through it, but people who go through that process generally have a grit that other people don't have. Can you talk about the correlation between that mission and the success, the high level and, and, uh, percentage of success in business that relates to that you know it's really interesting uh so for me i loved my mission right and because what it is is that it's it's for you, you know you grow up I, I went when i was 20 years old a lot of guys will go when they're 19 or 18 but you 
you get to take two years and dedicate it to a purpose that's above yourself, right? I don't, you don't get monetary gain. You don't get, you just take two years and you're going in, in, in the service of God, right? And uh, for me, I loved Africa. But the fact of the matter is that it, whether it be an LDS mission or, or any kind of really mission that's religious based, where you get to take time away from yourself and, and go dedicate to something higher is that it, it changes you because now you have to go out there without some reward right now today. You have to go out there and, and, and become somebody who uh, is willing to, to, to humble themselves like that. And that, for me, I loved Africa. I mean, everybody will love their mission if they do it right. But Africa, it holds a really special place in my heart because of the humility that you see there. I mean, you, you walk the, the streets. I, I spent half my mission in South Africa and half in Botswana. And Botswana's got my heart. I mean, it's two million people there. And it's just, you walk up the streets and, and you're the guy. They, they want you there. They, 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 there's a warmth towards towards the scriptures and God that I've never seen before in my life, but it hard and it sucks. And it's, it's one of those things where that's where I, where I really learned to, to choose your heart, right? That, yeah, going out there and, and teaching is hard going out there and trying to find people that this message will help is hard, but you know what else is hard is sitting at home and doing nothing, you know, being depressed, not, 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 not having a purpose and pushing towards it. And for me, that's that's where I learned that I'm always going to choose the hard that is purpose driven, that I've got a mission, whether it be religious or now in business and, and with, with my family. And I'm always going to choose the hard that's going to push that because it's so gratifying and it's so satisfying. So at what age did you did you start to uh, embrace this? Because when you say choose the hard, like, honestly, I, I, I'm feeling you on that. Like now as an old dog, like, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm further along or longer in the tooth, you would say. Um, but early on, man, like when my dad, my dad used to make me, we weren't doing a mission, but my dad used to make us knock doors uh, yeah. in fourth grade. And we Ugh. had to, we had to knock doors to mow lawns. And he said, you could, after you mow three lawns on a Saturday, then you could play. Well, he yeah. knew the, the ratio. My dad knew the ratio. Like you had to ask 21 to get three. Right. So by the time you asked 21, wheeled your uh, mower all the way around there, the day was done. You didn't get to play. I was not thinking about, damn, I want to choose my hard in yeah. fourth grade. I was like, man, I want to play. I want a popsicle. Yeah. I want to hang out. When did that change for you? When did that shift? Or were you always that, that guy? You know, I wouldn't say I've always been that guy. I've always, here's the thing is I grew up, my, my dad, he worked in, he works still in, in Hollywood. He, he, he makes movies. And so he, he's always made really good money when I was growing up. And, but the thing that he did was that the second that I turned 18, yeah, he'd still help me with loans or this, that, or the other. But I, I was basically, I had to pay for stuff on my own. And especially the, the second that I became a husband and father, that, that really changed things because now it's on me. I chose to become a husband. I chose to become a father, right? So now those decisions are, are on me. So I knew that I wanted to still live that same kind of lifestyle that I had lived before, but it wasn't given to me anymore. So now I got two choices, right? Either I can adjust the way that I want to live, which I didn't want to do, or I can go out there and, and get my butt kicked and, and work hard. And, and I, I always, it's always been so much more gratifying to go out there and try something and learn and, and bootstrap it and get it wrong and, 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 and still be fighting to do the thing. But I, you know, it's just so gratifying. I had a sales mentor once I worked at a company called called Weave, right? And that was an interesting experience. It was a tech company, but uh, this sales, the sale, it was VP of sales. He probably doesn't even know my name, but he said once in a post, he said he was talking about how he started at Weave and became a manager, and and it you know it was hard for him. He took half salary, but then he talked about it later. He said that too many people they're trying to do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. But the fact of the matter is that passion does not precede the work. It follows it. And too often we, we want to go do something we love first, first out the gate. But in reality, if I, I never knew I, when you're a little boy, you don't think I'm going to be a window man when I grow up, but I've built this thing up with my partner and, and it's, 
I love it so much because it is mine, because it was my sweat, my tears, my 12 hour days, my, my thinking it's not going to work. And now you couldn't get me off of this hill because the passion comes because so much work and dedication was put into it. So let's, let's go back. Uh, let's go back in time. Um, when I say young Kyle, Kyle, those of you listening and watching, you see his skin. This dude is still young. When I said to him, I was like, man, you know, he said, I'm 30. And it's amazing to see able to see what you built at 30 years old. But let's go back to even younger Kyle, right? Yeah. And you're talking about the, you know, that, that grit, that, that determination, a lot of times a person who grows up in maybe, you know, seeing a lifestyle that maybe is a little above the water, um, the second generation generally comes out consuming. So yeah. what was it that your dad showed you or what was it that your parents showed you or was it an uncle or was it your environment that showed you that you got to get out there and you got to go work? You know that, I mean, it really does come from my from my parents, right? And it's something that I've observed a lot too, is that so much of that comes from your parents. I am my, I'm my parents' only son. I've got three sisters, but that meant that I, you know, I, I was the only boy that my dad had and, and, and could kind of learn from him. But I watched him for, for whatever flaws our parents have and all of our parents have flaws, right? But I watched him just do, right? And, and I, I, what I learned is that he would say, Hey, I need you to go do this thing. And I'd be like, Oh, I'll try it. And I do this, 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 and it wouldn't work. And then he'd be like, oh, okay. And he would just go do it immediately. And I'd get so frustrated. I'd be like, you know, I, I'm embarrassed cause I couldn't do it. But what I learned is that the most, one of the most important attributes that you can have in this life is that you just get it done. It doesn't matter how it just needs to get done. And it's not, it's not a choice of, well, I'll go out there and try it. And that really, if something needed to get done, it wasn't, he didn't, he had made that decision a long time ago, right? It's like, it's like the, it's like the, the thing with integrity, right? Is that I don't need to decide not to steal this candy bar while I'm looking at it in the shop because I made that decision a long time ago. And it's the same, it's the same with, with grit and determination and making sure it gets done is that I don't need to decide today if I'm going to go get this thing done because I decided a long time ago that when something's placed before me and it needs to get done, I will be the one to do it. So when a person looks at a Kyle and looks at a hard charging entrepreneur, I mean, amazingly successful business, you just started another one, Bad Bet, Bet Productions, out of a frustration. Um, you know, I, I love this that you did that. We're going to talk about that. But yeah. So a lot of times when a person sees a hard charging guy like you, a successful businessman, you know, you're getting after it. A lot of times it, it doesn't motivate the people. Sometimes it demotivates because we want to know the knucklehead Kyle. And yeah. I know there's a knucklehead Kyle in there. Let's go back to that place where knucklehead Kyle was, you know, um, acting a fool a little bit. And maybe yeah. when you got, when you got roped in, where was a time in your life early on where you got roped in, you started to seal that, see that this stuff is real. Well, that's the thing is that, uh, you know, I, I once asked my father, how do you become a millionaire? And he said, a whole lot of luck. And I said, ah, I don't know if I believe that, right? And what I've come to realize is that it is a whole lot of luck for the introduction, right? For, well, you meet this guy. Well, that was lucky that I got to meet this guy or uh, this thing came across your lap. But then it takes all the work in the world to capitalize on it. But for me, I'm incredibly lucky in that uh, there's been times in my life, especially when I, I remember when I was early married, right? I, I, we, were, we had a young daughter, my, my daughter Allison, and I was 23, 24 years old. And I remember I got this job working uh, at uh, a title and escrow company. I, I was a marketer, so I would take guys out golf and go to lunch but I got lazy and I and I what I would do is I'd go into work I had to wear a button-up shirt and slacks which I hate I've never wanted to do that and I had to go in there and I'd check in in the morning then I'd go home and take a nap and relax and and then I'd go at two o'clock and go do a little bit of marginal work but I I I I had enough plausible deniability that I could be out that people wouldn't check on my work. And I took advantage of that and I got lazy. And the funny thing is that I got lazy and I blamed other, 
other things. You know, my wife would say, hey, you know, it's funny now. My wife's always like, well, I wish you were home more. Back then, she was like, dude, you need to get out of the house. You need to leave. Go do something. Uh, but I remember I, I went home one, one Christmas and I told my dad, and I said, man, I just, I don't get it. I'm doing all these things, but you know, uh, I've been betting on myself and it's a bad bet. Right. And he goes, no, you're wrong. You're a liar. Right. And I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, you're not working hard. You're, you're, you're doing a lot of talking, but you're not doing things. You're just, you're mentally saying, oh, I'm doing so much, but just not. And that's, and I walked away from that conversation saying, saying, I oh, forget you, you don't know. But I, when I'm driving home and getting introspective, I realized that I had done so much talk about it and so little be about it that I had nobody but to blame for but myself and uh, for my problems and for my, for my rut that I was in. It's just I had spent so much mental capacity thinking that I'm, that I'm a bad dude and so little actual action. And that's when it really clicked for me that that conversation going forward, I said, I'm never going to be the guy that says I'm going to do something and doesn't do it. That's when I said, and that's when my life changed was uh, that moment when I just said, okay, I'm going to actually go be about the work. And it is a night and day difference when you're actually doing it rather than just saying it. So take, take me back to like the high school times, because, you know, um, you know, for those of you out there listening, uh, number one, thank you so much for helping us to get in the, uh, well, it, when I say helping us, you guys did it. You got us in the top 1% uh, of podcasts globally. And wow. with, no, with no marketing, uh, with no advertisement, no paid ads, anything like that, um, you guys have all done that. And I want to thank you for that. For those of you listening, you know I'm from Lompoc. And so Lompoc, California, which the hat is in the back. You can see it right up top if you're listening. Uh, L-O-M-P-O-C is not Lompoc. It's Lompoc, yeah. right? And if you know that, you know that Lompoc, I mean, we, we didn't have like, you know, a, a ton of stuff. So when we heard of a Kyle that maybe was above water, we were mad at this dude a little bit because he probably got a car at 16 years old, right? Yep. Um, you know, and, and that car probably had all four wheels. Uh, you yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> so take me to that point because I remember hearing something that was said and it, 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 it hit me hard. Uh, Shaq, they were doing an interview on Shaq, and he said that my kids came to me and they said, Daddy, we're rich. And he was like, no, I'm rich. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm rich. This, this is what I've done. You had done nothing. Was your dad that type of dude, or was he more of a, a situation? I mean, because it's so hard to take a second generation and turn them into a Kyle Deaver now. And most of us are challenged because my kids aren't, aren't going through the things that I went through because I'm saying that I don't want them to. But I'm sometimes I'm thinking, well, if I don't take them through something, how are they going to be ready? Yeah. Take us to you that know, point. It's funny you say that. One of my I love Mike Tyson. I mean, Mike Tyson, he's a, he's a wild man, but I love all of his stories. And he told the story about his son came to him and said, hey, I want to go be a, a professional boxer. And he said, no, hell no. Because then you're going to go get in a ring with a guy like me. You grew up, <laughs> you grew up the way you grew up with rich and money. I grew up feeding pigeons and and, and with drugs and all these things, right? And, and and it's so interesting that and it's it's been a real concern for myself too because I've got kids and I I want to balance giving them everything and making them earn everything. You know what I mean? It, it's tough for me. Growing up, when I was 16, I had, I, I did get a car. I, I, I had privilege, but uh, he also. I've had to have a job from the time I was 15 years old. I, I remember. I remember I uh, I worked at a Quiznos that my next door neighbor owned. I was 15 years old. And I got fired from that. I remember one, what I used to do, Quiznos, is <laughs> they can't get me now, statute of limitations, right? But uh, you'd wa I'd walk down the line and I would throw pieces of the food in my mouth as I was making it. And I had a piece of chicken hit me in the back of the throat and I coughed it back on the sandwich. <laughs> and they fired me. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> then my next job I worked at, Joanne Fabric for three years and then Domino's. But I've always had to have a job because it was – if it was, hey, dad, I'm going to go out on a date. Can I get 20 bucks? Yeah, sure. But if it was, hey, dad, can I get an allowance? Hell no, right? It, because there's there's a real value in uh, learning how to work early, right? My parents wanted me to drive. They wanted me to have a car. They wanted me to work. They wanted me to understand that uh, 
this world it doesn't give out any freebies for sure right and and so that was i, I see a lot of people today where they're they want to wait till their kids 18 to work i said no that's crazy right put them in go get them a job right even my mom my dad made a lot of money but my mom still has worked for the last 35 years anyway so i grew up watching two parents that work go out there and, and do the thing and, and it's it left a big impact on me that work is uh, work must happen right and then it was only later that i understood the evolutions of work that i can work for my time or i can have my time work for me that kind of thing but i've had to work for me but make no mistake i've been uh I've been a crap head uh, for uh, most. I, I, I got, uh, I, I grew up, so the tough, the great part about my dad working in Hollywood was, you know, made a lot of money, had a nice upbringing. The bad thing, I, I always said, and I've had some thoughts and variations lately, uh, but I've always said my dad was a great uh, father, bad husband, right? Because when you're, when you're working in Hollywood, you're away for, four or five, six months away at a time. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the expression that if you hang out in a barbershop long enough, eventually you're going to get a haircut, right? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and I'll, t I'll be honest, as a father and husband now, uh, I, I've had thoughts that I, maybe that's a little bit too apologetic for my father. I don't know if there is a, a being a, a good husband and father to me is very intertwined because my kids are going to see how I treat my wife, their mother, that kind of thing. But that being said, he'd be away for a long time. And so uh, my mom was left to do a lot of the raising of us four kids. He'd get there in time to, you know, take me out. We'd go do some fun. He'd whip my ass and then he'd be back on the road again. Pardon my French. But um, it was interesting how I had to grow up. I got lucky in that I had a really good best friend. His name is Devonte. He's still my best friend. And we didn't want to get into the drugs and the alcohol. We just wanted to go mountain biking and we just wanted to go hang out. And so that was one of those other things where I just got lucky that I found the right person that allowed me to level up and, 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 and keep, keep on the track that I've been on. Well, let's let's stay in that in that realm because most of the time when I see people who are super successful at what they do in their business, and when I say success, I want to I want to the the caveat here is, and I always do this for my brother because I said a guy was successful and my brother said stop. He said, "Why are you saying that?" And I said, "Well, he's got a business and he's doing this." And he said, "Success and money aren't the same, and yep. they don't equal each other." He said, "When you talk to me, and he's very strong. My brother is a gangster. My brother yep. was like." When you talk to me about success, it better be about people doing the right thing and being in line with what their purpose to do. And yeah. and and I was like, oh, oh, okay, uh, well, this guy is um, uh, has financial prosperity. Uh, yeah. That's what I had to say to him. But so w when I find a person like yourself, most of the time, there's impacts that have happened, and you just talk, talked about one of them. There's impacts that happen that almost fuel us to move towards like I'm not going to be that or I'm not going to I don't want to see that sometimes it's you know living in a small place or not having something looking at your mom crying when she can't you know talk to us about those things and some of the things that you saw early on um, and as you can be as specific as you want because I asked you earlier if there was anything off limits and you said no and I recorded that so that's under you yeah. know I mean we, we got that written too so you can't come after Contract, that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the reason why I say it is because I think that that's a part that's not explored with a lot of people is you know you you take the you take the high flying people in our in our environments and most of the time they have major impacts that kind of push them towards it Right. What were yeah. yours? You know, I think one of the biggest things that pushed, you know, it's funny. I, uh, a lot of my, what I talk about focuses around my dad. He's had an incredible impact on me, but it, there's such a duality, right? Is that I love my dad. And now my relationship is better with him than ever, but for a specific reason, because my dad always grew up with money and it, we learn things from our parents that we promise we'll never do ourselves. Right. And 
what I learned from my dad is that uh, he would weaponize money in that, uh, yeah, I'll buy you the car, yeah, I'll buy you the phone, I'll buy this, but hey, you're not doing this thing that I want you to do, uh, well, I guess I got to take that away, I guess I got to take that away, and that's okay for a 15-year-old kid, 16-year-old kid for disciplinary purposes if they're not doing school, doing this, 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 but as a grown man, right, uh, with, a, with a wife and kids, uh, if something's going to be held up, you, you know, like uh, my parents aren't together. They're, they're still technically married, but they're separated. And so if he's if I'm not OK with a, a certain situation, he's in a, a girlfriend or something like that. Uh, if I don't run in with with total acceptance, then it's uh, then it's things start getting taken away. Right. And so for me. I knew always that I don't want to ever be beholden to another person. I want us to be friends because we're friends, right? I don't want us to be friends because I owe you something. I, you know, friends don't count favors. And so for me, I, I learned early on that what financial independence means to me, it means that I am not slave to anyone, mm -hmm. that I get to make my decisions on how we interact with each other based simply on how we interact with each other, not because there's some subtext, not because there's uh, a threat of me losing this thing or that thing, right? And so that's why it became so important to me to grind and work hard and become financially independent is because uh, I don't want to be beholden to anybody simply because, uh, because they have provided something for me. Now, when I provide something for somebody or somebody provides something for me, it's done out of the goodness of heart rather than a expectation of reciprocation, right? And that to me is incredibly important in any relationship. And, you know, it scared me. I'll tell you, when I, when I was in Africa, I remember one time, I, uh, I, there was this African kid, he was 17, 18 at the time, his name was Karabo, I remember, him. good kid. And I gripped his leg real hard, right? I was messing around with him and he started crying. And immediately, I didn't even do it on purpose. It was it was subconscious. I said, "Oh, hey, let me go buy you some candy, right?" Oh. And and I thought to myself, I, I mean, this was 2013, so nine years ago, and I'll never forget it the rest of my life. I thought to myself, I felt dirty after that because I've done something wrong, and rather than apologize and and uh, you know sympathize with this person, my first thought was, "Let me buy you something. Let me fix this with money." And it made me feel dirty then, and uh, I've tried to remember that always, is that money can do a lot of things, but what it can't do is make up for a relationship. And, and relationships are incredibly important to me. What was some of the things that you saw um, with, your, with your pop and your mom, that relationship? Because um, I, I think it's, it's big where, you know, we, we start to see a little bit of a men's movement. We hear people talking about being a good husband, being a good father, things like that. But a lot of times you don't hear the specifics. And then when we get into the specifics, a lot of guys say, I mean, I don't know that I could do all that. Right. And a lot of times for women, it's the simple stuff. I, I've, I've said before that my wife, I asked her, what's the sexiest, you know, thing that I do. And, and I was waiting and I thought it was going to be those pants that I wore or whatever. Yeah. And she was like, when you do the dishes, yeah, and, you know what I mean? So what were some of the things that you saw the interactions with your mom and your dad? And at what age did you and Devante start to be like, yo man, like I saw this with my pop. Like, I don't think I want to do that because there's, Two, there you you understand that there's two sides to this. One, yep. that that son becomes that that dad or that yep. husband, right? So, what age was it, and what were some of the specifics that you saw? Well, always. So the the thing is, he he would come home, and they just it, and to be clear, it was there was a lot of infidelity. I mean. That, that, that's what at what age that. did you know that that was starting to happen because or when did it register or when did you register yeah. it in your own head i'd say probably around middle school and and that that was the thing it's 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 tough t tough things as a husband and father now i i understand things a lot more right as a kid you're just scared you don't want things to happen this 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 but i, I remember one time he sat us all down he had probably been caught or something i don't know for uh, uh, a multiple of times. And he said, I want to tell you guys this thing, this thing happened. 
I'm never going to do it again. I remember that conversation when I was in middle school, right? He sat us all down. We're all crying. He's telling us that. And now as a, I remember the pain as a child, right? But I, now as a husband and father, if I think about having to have that conversation with my kids, I can't imagine that pain. But the fact is, there's a difference, but it's like the difference between motivation and discipline, right? Motivation will get you to lunch. Discipline will get you to the ball, right? And there's one thing to, it, it's about choosing your priorities. And for me, I, I look at my little girl, uh, my, my oldest daughter is six years old. I look at her and I think to myself, I, uh, even if I just was done with my wife, uh, even, I mean, cause she, it's, I've heard an expression or not an expression. I heard something once that picture the most beautiful, unbelievable woman in the world, just sexy, everything. And there's some guy out there who's sick of her crap. Right. And it's, a, it's the same as that wherever me and my wife are at, I, I look at my daughter and I think I've got to treat her mother the way that she needs her to see her done. Right. And so it's tough because we're all human and we're all natural men. And the natural man is an enemy to God. Right. It has been from, from, from the fall. And it's incredibly hard to be a good husband. It's incredibly hard to be a good father because it's so much easier to, uh, go do things that are, I, I was married when I was 24 years old. I didn't go party. I didn't, I, I didn't do anything. I, I can think to myself, man, I'm, I'm sad I missed out on those things. Or I can think to myself, man, I can't believe this life I've been able to build. But even still, I mean, I, I'll go out there and I'll work hard. And I, I, I saw something that said a good husband doesn't go home and kick up his feet. He rolls up his sleeves. But how does it, it how do you find the discipline to do that? I mean, it's so difficult to, and difficult, uh, difficult doesn't even describe it. The, the ease of coming home and just relaxing while they expect more of you. How do you deal with the, I mean, you can tell me, Kelly, how do you deal with the pressure of running the things that you run and still coming home and, and being not Clark Kent at home, but being Superman at home too, you know? <laughs> Well, I, I think that for me, uh, you know, it was it was a paradigm shift, right? So it was a paradigm shift that I, I used to take, and I used to uh, in, uh, introduce my family to my business, right? Yeah. Um, and I I learned that early, and that was a huge thing. Um, but what I did is I wrapped my family around my business. And so I would be like, oh, we're going on a work trip. Come, let's all go on a work trip and then I'll take a couple days off and we'll be able to do that. Um, you know, I'm doing X, let's wrap the family around it. And, and in my head, I was like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm winning as a dad. And yeah. then it, God really, really dealt with me. And he was like, I want you to wrap your business around your family. Meaning yeah. that if your son needs to get picked up at two o'clock, you ain't doing nothing at two o'clock, you ain't taking the meeting at one thirty, yeah. And that was a big one. And then the, the other thing was, is the only time in my life now that I ever feel stress or pressure is when I'm carrying something that I'm not designed to carry. And what God has let me know is that I'm only designed to carry his will. His will is light. And if I start focusing on my abilities, then he, then I feel more weight on me. And so yeah. that, but again, I mean, that's a, a constant, it's a daily, um, you know, when I talked to you this morning, I was at the beach and, you know, I was in Proverbs this morning and um, making sure that, you know, my, one of my buddies calls it putting on the armor in the morning. Um, yeah. But that, that is that, that, that's where mine, and thank you for asking, so. Well, I mean, that's, uh, it's tough, right? Because for my business, right? I've got, there's such a duality, right? You want to be a, you want to be a good man, but it's so hard to define what a good man is sometimes, right? Because I've got my family, my kids, my, but then I, I also think on my business, we've got, we've got north of, uh, including installers, 250 people who their, their dinner that night relies on making sure that we're making that, that I'm available. Right. And so it's tough because I also want my did you ever read the book Winning by Tim Grover? Of course. Yes, he's, a, he's phenomenal. Book. Phenomenal. Love that book. And he, he describes a time that he was packing up his suitcase, and his, da his daughter comes up and says, Daddy, Daddy, don't go. 
right? And he says, in, in a fairy tale movie, I'd unpack my suitcase and I'd do this, this, this. But it wasn't a fairy tale movie. I had to keep packing. I had to keep, and I had to go. And I, I have this struggle all the time. I mean, we're we're blessed now that we've got the technology to FaceTime, and you know, I can still see my kids every night and everything. But I don't know. How do you? How do you? you I guess you have to decide what you would want your legacy to be. But how do you leave that legacy behind that your kids will know that no matter what, you got to get it done, while not losing the family to man what a what a what a problem you know what i mean <laughs> well i could i could tell you this though man and 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 reading the book and tim grover a huge fan of his um i've asked I've, i'm actually after him to be on the podcast they they yeah. let me know that uh you know he wasn't booking for a, a year the last time and then i just keep hitting him and you know i'm yeah. gonna get him we're yeah. gonna get him on the podcast which i think is amazing um and but what i would tell you is this man as, and this ain't preaching, this is just experience, right? Yeah. Because it's crazy. In Utah years, I could be your dad. Damn. That's the, that's the crazy thing, right? Because I'm 47, you're 30. I mean, it's 17 years old in Utah. You yeah. know what I'm talking about. That's an old dude. So, yeah. but but I just, on December 19th last year, um, really big turning point in my life, there was a guy named Tom Cardenas, Thomas Cardenas, no middle name. He said he couldn't afford the middle name. <laughs> Grew up in Ophir, uh, outside of Tooele. Um, probably one of the most um, hardworking. When that's the reason why I was so attracted to our conversation, our friendship. Um, you remind me a lot of him. Mm-hmm. And uh, this this Tom Cardenas had a, a dad named Floverto Cardenas, and Floverto uh, used to pick uh, fruit during the uh, during the summer, and you know was in the military, but he would have different uh, different jobs. And being Mexican in Utah at the time wasn't the most popular, so yeah. he would. Um, there was one time where he was at the uh, at the bar, needed to get to work. Floverto went back into his car or went to his truck. His uh, drive had gone out, so right. but he needed to get to work. It was 15 miles away, so as opposed to calling it in, Floverto put that truck in reverse and drove 15 miles in reverse to be able to get to work. Yeah. He raised a guy named Tommy. They used to sit in the back of the truck and they used to pick, uh, pick fruit during the summer. And he used to tell Tommy, someday we're going to have a business. And they used to dream and dream and dream. Floverto died at uh, 44 years old and he never got the chance to see that business. Tommy grew up, had a couple of kids. Tommy never really got to, he went in the military. He went through a lot of different things, uh, raised the kids, uh, never got to, he never built his business or, or he built a business, but he never, but he got to see his youngest son build the first business in the family. He got to see the name go up on the uh, light and they, yeah. you know, him and his son were sitting and they were crying outside and watching that happen. And, uh, it was amazing to be able to know and, and be able to meet Tom Thomas without the middle name. Cause he couldn't afford it. Yeah. And on December 19th, he went someplace that he had always worked his whole life to go to. He had been saving up for this, uh, for this vacation, his whole entire life. And finally, December 19th, 2021, he finally got a chance to go there. And he was so, so excited all the way up to it. And the trip was to heaven. Hmm. And Thomas was my dad. Wow. And I could tell you this. I don't care what uh, suitcase you're ever packing, my brother. I don't care what job you're ever going to. I don't care what deal you're about to make. Because God could change the deal and he could do that deal while you're sitting there reading to your daughter and hugging her. I love me some Tim Grover, but I believe that uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would argue with that. Okay. Because I was that guy. Yeah. And I could tell you on December 19th when that man uh, went on the trip that he had worked his whole life to. And then on December 20th, he told me a joke. He said, you know, there was three guys. I went to the beach that next day and I was crying and I lost it. And I said, I was yelling out to God and I was yelling out to my dad. I was like, why you got to go, man? He was only 68 years old. I said, Pop, why you got to go, man? Why you got to go? Like, you're my buddy. You're my best friend, man. He said, dude, there was three. You ever hear the joke, son? He called me boy. He said, boy, you ever hear the joke? And I was like, Pop, how you going to joke at the time like this? Like, I'm sitting on the beach. I'm trying to talk to you. I'm, I'm sad. He said, boy, you ever hear the joke of the three guys on the island? I said, no, nah, Pop, tell me the joke. 
He said there was three dudes on the island. They found a little genie bottle. They rubbed the genie bottle. When they rubbed the genie bottle, a genie came out. He said, you get three wishes. All three guys were like, cool, we all get one. The first guy said, I want to go and travel around the world on planes and trains and automobiles. I want to live the life. Poof, he's gone. He's living his life. Second guy says, man, I'd just like to be back with my family. Poof, he's gone. Third guy looks around, scratches his head. He's kind of confused. Genie's like, time is ticking. He said, well, I can't think of anything. And the genie said, just pick something. Third guy said, I sure miss my friends. Poof, they're all back on the island. My dad said to me at that time, he said, don't be that guy. Yeah. He said, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a place that I worked my whole entire life to be at. So don't wish me back to that place. But I do want to tell you, son, be exactly where you're at, at the exact time where you're at, because God is big enough to be able to do what you think you're going to do at that time. Kyle, I don't generally talk on this podcast very much at all. I mean, I ask questions, and but I, I, I tell you, like that little girl, that wife, if you take and you put your focus 100% on them, all the deals in the world will come to you, flood to you, because God is big enough. That's beautiful, man. Yeah, honestly, it, it, it comes down to, you, you know, it's about being humble. And the hard part about the uh, humility is probably one of the hardest things in this world, right? Yeah. Because pride feels so good, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, one of the best tools, right? But you know, it's like you know, you, you the scripture says it's it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven, right? And it's it's because I, I've seen a lot. I see a lot of people who are successful who. Uh, grow up, they, they're they in a church, they're in the church, whatever it is, and they get really successful, then they start deciding that God's not for them anymore, right? And what it's the same thing that makes somebody have a successful business and then think that they can start 17 other successful businesses because they've got the Midas touch. And it's because what they started doing is they started relying on the arm of flesh. They forget that uh, they've I say the word luck a lot, and I get corrected by my wife and says it, it's blessings, of course, right? Uh, but yeah, it's really, it's really hard when, you, and hard is such an a, a interesting word, but it's it's meant to be hard to be successful and then be humble, right? Because it's uh, it's like playing tug of war against yourself. You're tugging one way to, to try and be able to provide a right living and get it just right. You're tugging the other way to be present and be there. And uh, it's too many of my friends that I've seen become successful then decide that they did it and they are inflappable and untouchable. And it's it's hard to watch. And even harder to watch in them is harder to watch it in yourself, right? Because we judge others by, we judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their actions, right? <laughs> but the road to hell is paved with good intentions, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's really, it's an interesting thought. You, you know, the other thing, the other thought I have all the time is that, well, there was, I heard this, this comedian once talking about, presidents of the United States, right? I think it was probably Joe Rogan or something. But he, you know, he was talking about Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky and people being just astounded that he could do that. And it's like, in order to become president of the United States, it's like becoming a king in medieval times, right? You just, you need to be the, the, the just most audacious and most hard, you know, hardworking and, and most dedicated and cutthroat and vicious to get there. And then they expect you the second that you get there to stop. <laughs> and it, you, you can't, right? Because you, you dance with the one who took you to the ball. And that's the thing is that it, it's tough to build a business and, and have it be successful and do all the, you know, have the grit that it takes to do those things. And then understand that when I'm back home, I'm not the CEO. I'm not the all powerful <laughs> guy. I'm dad and I'm husband and we're equals and you know, it, it's so tough to turn that off. Right. But tough is what this life is meant for. Right. You know, our purpose here is to prepare to meet God. So 
sign up for the tough, right? <laughs> well, it, it's amazing that, uh, you know, your, your humility and it, and it just continues to come out. And I, I want to applaud you on it, man. What are some of the things that, that you do in your life that, that helps to be able to keep you on track? Because I mean, you do all of them, even in your bio. And I invite everyone that's watching or listening. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the subscribe button because 84% of you who watch aren't subscribed. So just do it. You know that you should. It's the right thing to do. Um, but read in the bio and the bio is very short about what Kyle does as far as what he does, but it's mostly who he is, a husband, a father. You know what I mean? Like, what are some of the things that you put in play that keeps those checkers? I mean, do you you still have Devante in your life, right? That that no. doesn't care what you ever did, doesn't care how many windows you ever sell. He just is like, don't try and be a knucklehead to me. What other yeah. bumpers do you have in your life? Uh, well, I think one of my one of my best bumpers for sure is it, it's like uh, you know, for one, the gospel. I, I mean, I, I, it'd be. Uh, my business partner said something once. He said that the gospel is just this, it's this underwriting of our lives. Maybe we don't actively talk about it as much as we should or over the top, but it shapes decisions, right? Because it's about having an eternal perspective, right? Because, you know, it's, what good is gaining the, what good is gaining the world if you, if you lose your soul, right? And the thing is, I can think to myself, well, I could, I could make this, this other million, but I'd be giving up my integrity, right? Integrity is what, integrity is something that nobody can ever take from you, but only you can give away, right? And it's, it's what you do when nobody is looking, right? And for me, what's kept me in the bumpers all for, and what I hope will continue to do so, is that one day, uh, I need to stand across the judgment bar for sure. But before that day, I need to stand across from my, my wife and my children and know that the promises I made them, promises I made my wife uh, across the altar, the promises I made my children by bringing them into this world are, are bigger than myself, right? So, yeah, temptation and sin is fun, but it's not, rewar it's not everlasting rewarding. So it's, and, and make no mistake, I'm a bastard for sure. I'm, yeah, I'm a, <laughs> you know, I, I, I swear too much and I, you know, I'm, I'm not attentive enough in this, 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 but at the end of the day, I know that it, not, it's, it's like, uh, you know, that old thing that put on the fridge that says nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Right. It's, it's, I haven't heard. Hold on. You said like everyone in America has that on their fridge. Kyle, I have never heard. I, you, what, what'd you say? Nothing. Nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Right. Nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Meaning don't go eat so we can go get skinny. Right. God. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, that took a, like an hour to get to me. Yeah. Man. I mean, I have never heard that saying in my life. Yeah. I've heard a lot of sayings, Kyle. <laughs> you write it down. <laughs> that was yours, man. But yeah, on the on the same line is that uh, is that nothing nothing feels as good as being able to come home and be an honest man. You know what yeah. I mean? There, there's there's nothing that this world can offer that's better than what's offered here at home. You know what I mean? And so that's uh, I'm no I I'm not oblivious to temptation. I'm not. I'm not able to stay away from temptation, but what I can do is stay away from, I made that decision a long time ago that I'm not going to steal the candy bar. I made that decision a long time ago. And so I don't need to make that in the, in the moment, but it doesn't mean that I'm immune because again, it's about staying away from those situations too. I mean, going back to the longer you hang around a barbershop, you're going to get a haircut. I heard, I actually have a barber. His, his name is Cody. And he said, well, that expression actually goes a little bit further is that you hang around a barbershop long enough, eventually you get a haircut. You hang out even longer, eventually you become a barber. And so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that, that's what it is, man, is, is that, you know, my dad said something to me one time that uh, he said it to me when I was 14 years old, and I've never forgotten it. He said, once you do something once, you can never say, I haven't done that before again, right? 
you know, I was 14 and he was talking about drinking or, or, or smoking or whatever. And he, he, once I say, I can never say I haven't done that before. Right. And so that's why I hang on to is that these things that would be fun and cool and, and, and I surely enjoy, I can never again say that I haven't done that before. And I like being able to hold on to those. I haven't done that before. Kyle, what do you fear? Whew. You know, it's funny. I was, I was having a podcast and you know, this is, I've had this thought for a long time because my grandfather, he, one of my, I've still got one of my grandfathers, but one of my grandfathers, he passed away six, seven years ago. And he was a fire chief when he was uh, younger. You know, he was this, you know, he was a hero. He pulled people out of burning cars, you know. And I saw him in his later years, you know, he'd be limping around and he was lonely because my grandma died. And he would be happy when people would come by and visit. And he just, and I thought to myself, man, he was the man. He was the guy that everybody looked to. And now he's happy to get visitors. And I think that's my biggest fear is that right now I'm the man. I, I mean, people turn to me from left, right, and center. My whole company, they, they, they call me, they this, this, this. But I know that one day I'm not going to be. I remember, you know, I had a junk hauling business down in St. George. What I would do is I'd... I was desperate to do anything to, to make some extra cash. And so all week, Monday through Friday, I'd put out this ad on Facebook that I'll come haul your junk away and I'd line up jobs. And then Saturday, I would go rent a truck from a, from a storage facility, go get all the jobs, take it to the dump and make $300, $400. Right? Definitely wasn't worth it. But I remember I did this job for this one person and she had an elderly father who had dementia. And this was his daughter. And she said to me, she said, oh, uh, you know, and she wasn't being malicious. She was just trying to give me some instructions. She said, oh, just ignore him. He'll talk to you. Just ignore him. And I thought to myself, man, I'm so terrified of one day my daughter having to tell people just ignore him. You know, so that that I'd say is my biggest fear. I mean, obviously, there's a fear of I mean, I've set up financially so my kids will be OK if I go. But my kids growing up without a dad, that'd be incredibly tough for me. But I think a, la a lingering fear for me is that I'm the guy and one day I won't be. And there's no sense even having fear about it because it, it will happen. One day I will not be, you know, maybe I'll always be the patriarch, but I won't be the guy. It'll be my son, hopefully, and, and, and somebody after that. And it's scary. When do you think that the pressure will be off of you? Oh, that's the thing, man, is that I, I love the pressure. I, I, I you know, I, I, it's, I was always jealous of people who got called workaholic, right? You know, envy is a sin and I am a sinful man when it comes to envy. <laughs> and I don't, so I'm you're a normal, of, you're a normal guy then. That's what yeah. it is. And, and I'm not envious of people's money or people's this, this is, I'm envious of their ability to, to work and grind. You know, there was a time, a long time in my life where every day I'd wake up and I would wake up to see how negative my account balance was. Cause then maybe today it's only, it's only a little bit negative and I can just go donate some plasma <laughs> or if it's really negative, I gotta go, you know, go do a junk haul job or something like that. Right. And now I don't have that problem is, you know, I don't need to check my account before I make a purchase. I think, and I miss it. I, I miss the the animalistic back against the wall. I've got to go fight today. So I've had to create that in my own mind still. And even still, I'm scared of losing it, which, uh, you know, there would have to be some catastrophic events for me to do that. But it's, uh, it, it's tough, man. It's tough to be able to uh, continue to grind and, 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 and keep yourself going. But in regards to the pressure, I love the pressure. I love, I, I wish there was more, right? My, uh, I, I've got a rags to riches. I was in, I was in $145,000 worth of dirty debt. I had a, a $4,000 loan on my tires. That was like 26%, right? It was crazy. And, and, uh, and on your tires, on you have to, tires. you, you, you can't, you can't gloss over. Uh, you said $4,500, loan on your tires on my tires tell us about this tell us about this tell us about this come on 
Well, that's the thing is that I I kept betting on myself. I mean, that was that was the impetus that eventually got bad bets. I kept betting on myself. Uh, uh, I'd buy a moving train. I so I I owed my father forty five thousand dollars. I owed my younger sister twenty thousand dollars. I owed one of my good friends five thousand. I had payday loans here here. My credit cards they they shut them all off on me. I, I had a four hundred and fifty credit score. I was deeper than than it felt like I was breathing through a straw right but still I'd go home and I've never been one to I'm not an emotional dude my wife has never seen me cry before uh and it's just I'd go home and I I would just have these things internalized right because for me uh, and it's it's a wrong way of thinking in fact I catch myself now because when I was growing up if I was crying my dad would say we can't talk until you stop crying so crying became a bad thing Right. And so I even catch myself now with my kids saying, hey, quit crying. Right. And my wife, who never stops crying, uh, will <laughs> uh, will get on me about it. Right. And, and I, I recognize the need for emotion. Right. But I just I've always been one that I can take it, put it on me. I'll take the world. I'll, I'll take the weight. And I'm not going to make it somebody else's problem by telling them that. Uh, hey, I'm struggling. This is which is a wrong way of thinking, right? Because if you want to go, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together, right? And it's it's been a hard thing in my life to be able to better rely on people and and let out my dirty laundry from when I'm a kid. But it's it's so much more rewarding to not have to hold onto that pressure all the time, all the time. But that, the thing is, I would look at people, going back to me being envious of people's work, even now, I was stopping by one of our offices on the way back from a date night with my wife. And in another office, I was just picking something up. It was 11 p.m., and there was a guy working. And I thought to myself, this was some other company, man, I wish I could be that guy again. I wish I had the work to do it, all. which is crazy, because when you're doing it, you're like, oh, I want to be the guy who doesn't have to do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> But but now I'll go on vacation. It'll be day three, and I'll be like, okay, I, I want to get back to work. And so that's it, it's because I've got a purpose, and, a, and a, I'm, I'm driven, and I've got those things. But I love the pressure. But I need to be better about mitigating it and, and being with my family. That's the big thing for sure. Now I, I find I was just talking with my friend the other day, and he's a he's a hard charging guy, uh, alpha uh, alpha male like yourself, and. Um, and I think one of the hardest things for alphas to accept is peace, right? Because mm -hmm. when it's peaceful, um, we have the tendency to feel, now I need to get up and go do something, create some chaos yeah. so I can, when did you realize or do you realize that you're more comfortable in chaos than you are in peace? Oh, for sure. I'm more comfortable. It's, it's like you said, when you're a warrior, you want war. You know what I mean? It's because you've got a purpose. And... <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's, I explained to my wife, you know, I, I, what I wanted to do from the beginning with my wife was make sure that she never woke up one day and realized that her husband, she's been sleeping next to a man that she didn't know for 20 years. And so I've told I, from the, from jump street, if, you know, if I've got an opinion or I've got a thought or whatever it is, I just, I express it to her. Right. And it causes some strife because I'm very candid. Right. Um, but what I've explained to her is that I feel at home in the chaos. Right. I, I describe myself as a triage nurse and I love it. I want to, you know, I met my business partner. We, we were, we were servers at Buca de Beppo. Right. Uh, it's an Italian restaurant. He's still on my phone as Levi Buca. That's how I met the guy. But, <laughs> For me, I loved being a server because it's madhouse. It's chaos. And the thing is, I would see people get, I mean, did you ever serve tables? Okay. I, I didn't. I worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken, but I didn't yeah. get to serve the tables. Uh, so in, in when you're a server, there's something, uh, it's a common expression, but it's called in the weeds, right? Where you're you're just, you you get to a point where it's so much, you, you kind of freeze up. And I would watch them one by one by one get in the weeds and be like, I can't take any more tables. And I'd say, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> because I knew what I was here for. I was here to make money. But also, it's just, it feels so good to go and, 
and be the guy that can go clean up the problem, be the, be the triage, right? And so I, it's like uh, Sam, you know, did you ever see The Last Samurai? Uh, no, I didn't. I actually did. That's Tom with uh, Tom Cruise. How is Tom Cruise going to be The Last Samurai, though? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Actually, that's why it, people it, hate America. That's why people hate America. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is a good movie. It, 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 the, the, the whole impetus behind it is that the samurai, you know, it was modernization, that normal military and everything. And the samurai had no place there anymore, right? Is that when you build yourself up to be a warrior and you, you learn how to do these things and you're, you're that guy, and then you go to a, a, a place of peace, it, it, you know, Trump, he talked about some banker friend of his, right? And his father told him, when you retire, you expire. And it's true that when you're the guy that, you know, I've seen, I've seen people retire and just fall off the map and be, be unhappy because you're built to build. You know what I mean? And we've got this, we've got this inner, inner purpose to build, right? And that's an eternal principle is that we're, we, we've got to go build, right? Uh, for me, I've, I've always known that, you know, the term damnation, right? Uh, you can take it to mean a few things, but I think of it less like fire and brimstone. And I think of it like an actual dam in the water is that ah. it stops your progress. Okay. Right? You're not able to go forward anymore. And that is, is hell to me would be no more progress not being able to improve not being able to push forward and build and uh that's why i mean you see people who are unemployed or not working they're not happy right there was a there was a story that got told uh i think it was in think and grow rich and that book i'll, I'll tell you i i struggled with a lot of it but he had <laughs> <laughs> wasn't my cup of tea but he told a story about in england there was uh there was this strike of all of the people on welfare. They stri they went on strike because the mailmen would drop off their welfare check at 9 a.m. and they wanted to sleep in, right? And it's it, it, it's so part and parcel of you're not happy when you're getting it for free, right? It's a you know I just finished a book called uh, The Cult of We. It's about we work. Are uh -huh. you familiar with we work? Yeah. Yeah, and and Adam Newman and all that, and and the Hebrews they talk about, they talk about shameful bread, right? Which means bread that you earned and went and worked hard and you made yourself taste delicious, but bread that they just hand to you, it, it, it it's not, it doesn't taste good, and and that's what this life is for. Is we're meant to make our bread. So help me with this, Kyle, too, because. When I mean, and you hear it, if you go back and go back and listen to the episode, it's going to be so awesome because you're, you're speaking it. I get to hear it. So, I mean, you're just dropping bombs over and over again. Let's talk about the voracious reading that you do. And because this is something common in people that, that get to a chance to fly high in life in certain areas. How often are you reading? Are you doing uh, audio books? Are you doing physical books? Are you doing digital books? What are you doing? So I, I do audio books. I'll tell you, I had the longest battle with myself that oh i want to i want to turn the pages i wanted this i want but then i had to choose right either i get to consume a lot of books or i get to consume two or three because i just don't have the time and so i switched over to audio and i love it right but it's i always was that's one of those other things where i was envious of people who could just go through books and i would think how do they do it and then i got on audiobooks i was like oh that's how it, it, it's amazing <laughs> And, and so for me, it's finding a book that I, th I think there was something, I forget where it was said, but every book has three or four big pieces that get to change you. Everything else is cool and, and surrounding it, but being able to find that three or four things that, that you remember from each book forever is so big for me, right? And then there will be books, I've got 80 I guess it's ADHD now. When I was a kid, it was ADD, but now it's all ADHD. <laughs> I guess. And so the other thing is when you find a book that, it, you know, maybe a friend, I just finished a, The Cult of We yesterday, right? <clears throat> that was recommended from my business partner. And I wanted to put my head through the wall because it was 14 hours long. And it was, you know, it talks about how Adam Newman, you know, how he brushed his hair sometimes. I, it was too much detail. I, I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> couldn't do it. But... 
for me, once I started it, there's just this thing inside of me that I must get through this book, right? I, I can't leave something because maybe there was something in there that was good, right? But then when you find the books that make a difference in your life, it it's so satisfying to find the four or five books in a year that you're just like, wow, that thing, I can't stop thinking about the, that book. There was a few books this year for me that really – really hit for me one first and foremost was uh did you ever read shoe dog by phil knight oh yes amazing oh, that's probably the one of the, my favorite books i've ever read it was i mean that was 14 15 hours but yeah I, I loved that book because it's just it's a fighting spirit loved it uh you ever read the richest man in babylon yes oh man what a the the concepts in there about living like a slave or living like a free man and, and, and what you're doing. Loved it. I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, atomic Habits. My brother is huge on Atomic Habits. Have you ever read it? I haven't read it yet. That's the one. That's I'm In fact, I'm, okay. I'm re-listening to it to get ready. It's only five hours long. Okay. I'm re-listening to it uh, to get ready for the new year for some of my resolutions. Atomic Habits is a game changer for sure. Uh, and, and then there's a few fun books in there. But honestly, it's... I, I do a mix. I'll do fun book once in a while, and then I'll get back into the business books. But when you find a book that changes you, it or, or that just really stands out, and and there's some books that have three or four things that really stick out to you, and then there's some things that you just you're, you're eating it up. There's nothing more exciting to me than finding a book that just it's like I'm watching a motivational video over and over and over. I just feel like I'm drinking from this well of knowledge, and I feel. Like a grown up, you know, and I feel like, a, like, oh, I'm doing something cool right now. You know, I read the book. That, that has been a big push. So for this next year, one of my big resolutions, my goal this year was to do 50 books, okay, which was a, a book a week, less two weeks, right? And I fell way short of my goal. I, I ended up at 17 books, right? It's still a lot, man. That's a ton. Yeah, yeah. and and but this next year, I'm going to do a book a week because. Being able to say, being able to consume that and the value I got from those 17 books where I still remember this thing or that thing or this thing or that thing, I want to explode that and have it be from the 50 books because, you know, they, they say the average CEO reads however many books in a year or whatever. I always thought, wow, that's malarkey, right? I thought so too. Yeah. In fact, I think it might be, but it's so satisfying i mean one i've i've got the ocd where when i get to see five minutes left, i'll listen to it right i'll listen to the ending part where it says this was recorded in <laughs> so and so because i want to hear it go out i want to hear the outro you know what i mean it's so satisfying but it's also so satisfying knowing that you can say oh i remember this thing from that thing you know what i mean and it's also such an equalizer it's such a, a bringing together of people if i say to any I, it's a guarantee i know how to start any conversation or i know how to compliment any corporate business person period right is that you talk to them a little bit and be like, have you ever read who moved my cheese right <laughs> And they're like, yeah, Ken, like, Ken oh, Blanchard, you're, baby, yeah, you're you're a real sniff and scurry, and they're like, oh, really? <laughs> That's it's a guaranteed compliment on anybody, you know what I mean? And it's just it's so fun to be able to connect with people over shared knowledge, you know. Well, I think the trick that you have that I want to I want to dive into is. Uh, Kobe Bryant said at one time where he, uh, they, people asked him if he was going to be a coach and, and he was like, I ain't trying, I'm not going to be a coach because not every great player can coach. Now there are great players like a Deion Sanders that you're seeing that are the outliers that are a great, co a great player. And then they become a great coach. We'll see this year. I don't think Colorado is going to win the national championship. That's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. But most of the time, I mean, you look at a Steve Nash, one of the greatest of all time, and then he goes into a coaching situation and it's a bomb, but that's because Brooklyn isn't going to ever beat the Warriors. Right. <laughs> so you have found the Holy Grail, though, because you are this force of nature, but also you have created a, 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 a tribe and a culture of forces of nature. What is, like, help us to understand how you've been able to construct that. Well, <laughs> you know, the thing is, I am really good at talking with people when we're talking, but I'm not good at the intro. I'm not good at walking up and saying, hey, 
I'm Kyle. Nice to meet you. This is what I do. What do you do? It's always been awkward for me. When I go to these masterminds, I'm the one who's like, oh, I see a, an empty table over there. Yes. I don't have to go, you know, meet, you know, and, and do the intro thing. And so I've, but I've always wanted to be part of masterminds. I've always wanted to be part of podcasts. I've always wanted to be better at networking. I'm just, I'm not good at it. You know, I can talk when we're talking and I've got things that I can share, but I'm not good at lining it up. So I started my podcast strictly as a tool, right? To be able to meet these people that I want to speak with and give them a platform to, you know, to have some value to be able to come and tell their story. But I just wanted to meet them, you know, and I just wanted to talk to them. And that, that led me to what's, what people never understand. People always talk about networking. Your network is your net worth and, and so on. And I always just thought, I mean, those are just axioms. They're just, they're just, throwaway comments. But to me, what's been so insane is that when I started putting my shoulder to the wheel of networking, it's like a, a an uncontrollable spider web. It just boom, goes like crazy and you don't even see it coming. So I meet this person who introduces me to Sean, who introduces me to 80,000 people, right? I mean, Sean is the, <laughs> he, he, he's, you call him Tony Spark, well, you should call him a spider man because he's got the web, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, it's just, it's been insane to me. But then I look at it. So I've got a group called the Utah Seven, which is just these seven guys that we get together. Uh, there was a, there's a man named Jason Walton. He owns Moxie Pest Control. And he's really an inspirational dude. Um, and I was talking to him one time and I was telling him, I've got this problem where I can't, I'm having a hard time finding mentors, right? Because I, I, I earn a certain level, you know, I, I earn a, a lot of money. And so I can't walk into my local church and ask, what would you do in this situation? Because most of the people don't have this situation. Yeah. But a lot of the people who are above me in in the pay grade and who have experienced things that I'm currently going through, I don't agree with their morals and their values. And they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're, they, we don't line up. And so it's been so hard. And so I was talking to Jason about that. And he said, whenever I go to a place, I find six or seven people that are like me right? They don't even need to be above me, you know, in age or anything like that. But I latch on to those people. I make them my, my people, right? And so that's why I put this group together because I always wanted to be a part of, you know, these close-knit groups. I always wanted to be a part of these masterminds. And so what I just decided is that rather than wait to get invited for one, I'm just going to go do it myself, <laughs> right? I just, I, I'm going to go do it. And, and that's what's kind of, what's been my thought and what everybody should do is that if you want to be a part of that thing, yeah, start, I mean, start networking, start talking, go get out of your comfort zone. The, the fact of the matter is that there is no growth in the comfort zone and no comfort in the growth zone. Right. And so get really comfortable with being uncomfortable, but it, it, it's definitely a choose your heart. Right. I tell people work is hard, but riding the bus is hard and I'm going to choose work every damn time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> do you now do you get a chance to spend a lot of time with your mom now uh with not not often but they live in california my mom lives in california my dad lives in atlanta we get back for the holidays she my mom is great about she she's a she's always wanted to be a grandma and so she, whenever there's a kid's birthday she makes it out for it and she she's very good about that but that's the other thing too is that you, you know not to go all the way back to it but i haven't always had the best relationship with my mother and why do you think that is well, I, I actually just had a talk with my dad the other day. I don't, you know, my dad has made a lot, you know, he's been made a lot of money, been, been the man for a long time. So there's been a lot of now because he doesn't pay for anything for me because I do everything myself. Me and him have gotten really close because, uh, there's no strings attached. We have to be, he has to be cool to me or, you know, it's, uh, yeah, good luck. <laughs> um, and I had a talk with him the other day because I, I had, you know, not the other day, but a few months ago, I'd gotten into it with my mom. And he said to me, he said, you know, I, and he said to me something that he said a lot in my past. He said, I had never did that to my mom. I, I would, I can't believe, I would never dream of speaking to my mother like that. Right. And I had had enough of hearing that for years. And I said to him, yeah, but let me ask you a question. Did you grow up like I grew up? Did you watch your father, father saying the things to your mother that I did? Did you see your mother being dealt with in the way that I saw my mother being dealt with? So, yeah, I know it's wrong that I go off, that I'm rude, that I'm this, this, this. But it's all I've ever known. 
And so that's a big thing for me with my kids is that uh, I need to be better. I, I intentionally am better in front of my kids than when it's just us because I want them to know how they should treat their mother and uh, and how they should treat the people that they love in their life. So what I found too is, uh, you know, right down that line is – when, when you start to see growth in any area of your life, it's almost like you have to have a, a, some sort of protection, right? You have protection over your kids. Um, you have protection over your wife and you guys' relationship based off those things. And let's go back to the business part of it, the Utah 7. What are some of the things that you're looking for with friends that you allow people in? I've got a friend named TK, and if you are listening, I believe you are, TK. You're incredible. We always have conversations like this because TK is very, very, you know, um, he has a prosperity in the financial area. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. He's a very successful guy because he spent a lot of time with his family and he's just an amazing human being. But we've talked about his filters that he has to have because he can't just allow anyone around him because sometimes people will just take advantage of that. Okay. What have been the filters and when did you start to become conscious of them? Y- you know, um, Give me an example of what you mean before I answer that. So, so uh, like, I don't introduce everybody to TK, right? I don't in- introduce everyone to Sean. Like, if yeah. I introduce someone to Sean, it is because they're in line, not only in the, the, the heart sense, the mind sense, the, the financial sense, the business sense. So I, I filter all that before I ever would put them on a text with Sean. Right. Yeah. Because Sean's very important to me and I know his time is super valuable. And I'm, I, you know, and I have a lot of friends like that in my life that I just, I wouldn't go about introducing just anyone to them. You seem to have this filter in your life for yourself. When did that become prevalent for you and what is a part of that filter? You know, <clears throat> for this one, I mean, speaking of the Utah 7 specifically, that was put together. Uh, to be high earners, similar, similar value systems, kind of, you know, that way we can discuss the gospel. We can discuss business all in one without, because too often in business, uh, even though the gospel, you know, it just, it, it, even though it could, it, it doesn't often, right? It, yeah. We're speaking shorthand to each other, right? We're, we're trying to get from A to Z as quickly as possible. And, and, and that's business terms, right? I put that group together because, I wanted to be able to discuss the gospel and business at the same time, right? Because uh, to me, being able to keep those tied together my whole life has been able to keep me going where I'm going, right? But in terms of the other side, for me, here's the filter I have, right? For me, I always want to be a help to somebody else. If I can give some of my time, I, I want to do it, right? But there's always this, this balancing act, right? that I see these guys, okay, here's a good example. I see these guys that are 40, 45 years old, and they're going on weekend trips with their buddies all the time. They're just, they're always, you know, a boy's trip to Alaska. I mean, it's like 20 times a year. And I think to myself, well, you can only do that because you don't have kids or something because for me, I don't have, you know, I'd like to have those long lasting friendships, but the reason why me and Devonte are so good friends is because we, we can go like uh, a month and a half without talking to each other and we pick it right back up. And so when it comes to being able to help people, I, I always want to have a teaching heart and I, I want to give what I've gotten. And I've gotten, I, I look at people like Sean or the other mentors in my life that you know, you know, Sean is like one of those guys. You said you, when did you meet him? About a year ago? Uh, it's been a little over a year, probably about a yeah. year and a half. Yeah. Sean to me is one of those guys that when you meet him for the first two months, you're, you think to yourself, why is this guy being so nice to me? What, yeah. what, what, what is this guy, you know, you, you know, and it's a flawed way of thinking, but what is this guy getting out of it? And then you realize that he just, is genuinely a happy and it makes you a better person. It makes you want to do more of that. Right. And so to say I have filters, I, I, I wouldn't say I, I've got them in place for people that I want to get together and people I want to meet with. But the only filter I have is, is I understood a long time ago that I can meet somebody. I can, I can, I can spend a, I can spend an hour with anybody. Right. It doesn't matter. Right. But I learned a long time ago after uh, that, 
uh, after that hour, there's some decisions to be made on, on if there will be more time, right? Because you, you've only got so much and certain people deserve it, right? Which hopefully doesn't come off as jaded. It's just, it's, it's like when I talk to my, when I talk to my wife, when I, it's like when I talk about family, you know, my wife thinks I'm a, a bastard sometimes because she was raised up that family can do, you know, can do no wrong. Family is everything. And family is incredibly important. Yes. But so is just relying that we've got the same same blood doesn't allow somebody to act a certain way toward me, right? We still need to love each other, but more importantly, respect each other, right? Uh, that, so those are the filters that are in my life is that, hey, I'll meet you, I'll hang out with you, we can have a connection, but if there's not mutual respect and we, we treat each other in a certain way, then I don't need it, you know? So Kyle, how does a person with you, with you, you did what most people not not every single business owner desires, but I would say probably ninety nine percent of the uh, small or like small medium business um, would desire, but the other the one percent that says they don't desire it, they just won't tell somebody. Yeah. And because you took it from the business, and then you were able to scale it. Yeah. Um, and so can you talk about that process and the difference between a person who stays in their, in their lane, they just stay in that safe place, and then the person who literally goes for it. And I mean, you started it in Utah, but now it's nationwide. And yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a behemoth, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, you've done this at a very, fairly early age, very early age. Um, what are some of the, um, cause, Okay. Let me let me back up a little bit. My uh, uncle, uh, my my wife's uncle, actually, so I call him my uncle. He um, coaches in the major leagues, wow, and yeah. I asked him, "How do you manage like and coach like professional athletes?" He said, "I don't. I just ask him questions." He said, "The difference yeah. between a home run and a foul ball is that much on the right. swing," and I find that in business too. The difference between a person having their and I'm not, I'm not taking away from the work part of it, but when a person that has a business and then a person who expands the business, I find that the differences aren't like catastrophic, like so huge. There's minor shifts. What were those minor shifts that you see that? <clears throat> uh, two things for me have led to my, uh, how do you say it? Financial, uh, prosperity, prosperity. <laughs> <laughs> Two, two things have led for my financial prosperity. The first one is that I have never been afraid to leap, right? There was, there's three separate occasions that I've come home and told my wife, Hey, I quit today. Uh, and two times it was right before, like one was, uh, two days after we had our first child came home and said, Hey, I quit today. I'm, I'm going to go do a different job. And the other time, one of the other times was uh, a month before my, my son was born. Uh, so I've never been afraid to leap. Right. Because the thing is, if you're worried about risk, uh, wait till you get the bill for not taking one. Right. And, and for me, I, I, you know, maybe reckless at, at some points, but uh, I've always said my wife's greatest contribution to our financial success is that she's always been supportive. She trusted me when she married me. She knew that I was going to go out there and do the work. And so when I come home and say, hey, I quit or, or I'm going to quit. Maybe there's some, oh, are you sure? But there's always 100% okay, let's do it kind of thing. And because she knows that she would hate to see me be stuck in a position that I don't want to be in for, the, for, for my whole life just to appease her. And so she's been an incredible supporter in that. But so one, I've never been afraid to take a risk, right? Even to, to you know, I haven't really, I mean, I've, taken in the teeth plenty, but I've never been afraid to take a risk. But the second biggest thing always is that I know what I do not know, right? So people will always tell you, oh, don't have a business partner, don't this, this, this. My business partner, uh, for me financially, is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Because for me, I am a sales guy through and through. I'm Sales is in my blood. I, I love sales, right? But what I am not is I am not a detail guy. I am not a numbers and how this is going to work and how that's going to work but he is incredibly so in, in fact to my greatest of annoyances sometimes so detailed but the thing is without him 
Are we would I could I you can't sell something that you can't I can sell, but he's he's able to help with the scaling, right? And and he's a he's a salesman in his own right. I don't want to sell him short, but was, he was able to build this thing, and so I was able to focus on the people, building the sales teams, and, and building them. So that was the biggest thing for me. And with, with everything I do, I know that I don't know numbers. I know that I don't know details and minutia. And I know that I know how to sell. And so I surround myself with people, including most of the Utah Seven and the people I are, are all financial guys because I don't know anything about finances. My 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 business partner, he's a he's, he was a economics major. He'll come in and say, "Man, did you see what the Dow did this day?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, stonks. That's crazy, right?" I don't know anything about it. Right? <laughs> but what I've done is I I've I, I've allowed I've set myself up because I don't want to know about those things, right? but I want to be successful in them. So I've surrounded myself with people who are, right? So I know what I don't know. I know what I enjoy doing. And I lean on the people that know how to do it. You are an absolute genius, man. It is so, it's so cool to be able to see the humility because most of the time people aren't willing to say like, I don't know that thing. And you know, it, but what it does is it attracts, it disarms people. And I just, I, I compliment you, man. Uh, Appreciate Kyle, I started the podcast because of my kids, um, Maddox and McKenna. So Maddox is 11 years old. McKenna is 14 years old. Uh, Maddox is uh, that, that kid that literally picks up anything and can do it the first time. He's just a super talented kid. And he's got, uh, he beats to the, or he marches to the beat of his own drum. He's got his own style. He's just always doing his own thing. Um, and McKenna is got one of the biggest hearts in the world. Uh, incredible, incredible woman. She is her comedy is off the charts. Sarcasm with dad though is a little strong all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Always giving me a hard time. I started it because I wanted to take iconic figures like yourself. That at thirty years old you could build a a, a multi 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 million dollar company that is nationwide. And do it because you know what you know, you know what you don't know, and you put yourself around phenomenal people, and then you stick to your strengths. And you have one of the greatest attitudes that I've ever been around and the humility uh, to match. Um, but I wanted to take people like yourself, and I wanted to show my kids that anything is possible. And not from a standpoint of like, you know, uh, all, all you have to do is just think it, it'll happen. No, I mean... If you listen to Uncle Kyle, you'll realize you're going to take it on the teeth, you're going to take it on the chin, you're going to take it upside the head. But as long as you have that grit, you're going to be able to move through it. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna, Uncle Kyle? And if you could use both their names, it would be awesome. Yeah, what I would say, Maddox and McKenna, is that uh, really that that passion does not precede the work. I mean, that that's kind of become my mantra is that people tell you do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life they've got it wrong do some work and you'll never you'll never stop loving a day in your life right <laughs> and so put the work in and the passion will come uh and uh and listen to your dad because uh for me too here, here's another big piece of advice maddox and mckenna is i'll tell you is that People don't have it figured out. You're the most successful guys you know, the, the titans of industry, I, I've sat at tables with them and seen where they're falling short and where they wish that they could be better, right? Life is meant to, to work and get better, but continue the progress forever, and, and, and that's what we're here for. Kyle, you have been, I mean, unbelievable. I'm going to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life. I told you that you, when we when we texted it at the beginning, man, and, uh, you know, when we first met. Um you know, now's the time if you're out there listening, you're watching, um, like I said, smash, don't even push, but just smash the subscribe button because you know, it's the right thing to do. Um, the other thing is I want you to share this. Um, I want you to share this with someone who has a business because Kyle is that guy. Kyle's that guy because he's not trying to be that guy. Kyle is the, the, the mentor that is not going to say, Hey, I'm the mentor and you need to come to my program. Kyle's just out there doing it. And if you get around him and you watch him, you listen to what he's doing, then you can do it too. And I, what I love about it, Kyle, is that you're not a talker, you're a doer. And you just happen to talk about what you do. And there are so many people in our world, Kyle, and you see this, that are not doing it and just talking about it. Yeah. 
And uh, I, I appreciate you. So I want everyone out there listening and watching, I want you to share this because I believe it could truly impact so many different people on so many different levels, family-wise, um, you know, business-wise, personal-wise, all those things. Um, and again, I want to thank you for helping us to be in the top 1% globally for all podcasts, which is unbelievable. Um, also, uh, because you guys sharing and because you guys doing that, you also made us in the top 5% of uh, podcasts that are shared on Spotify. And so... I, I thank you. Um, check the sponsors. Do what you need to do. Click the links. Do all those things. Check out uh, Kyle's website and uh, make sure that you force him to be on the show again, Kyle. Right? You're going to be on again. Big time. Yes. Um, but I, but honestly, man, I mean, it has just been an absolute pleasure to spend this time with you, and it's an honor to be your, uh, to be your friend, man. Kelly, thanks so much. Appreciate you, my friend. You're officially off the hot seat. <laughs>